Good morning. Good morning. Happy Good morning. Saturday. When men have to swim against the stream, there is a wake of waves driving them back. But then let a hand be stretched forth, as was an elder's brother's hand, <coughs> to a sinking Peter. Let the one who is supposed to have moved wrongly be given no occasion by his brother to become discouraged, but let him feel the strong clasp of a sympathizing hand. Let him hear the whisper, let us pray. The Holy Spirit will give a rich experience to both. It is prayer that unites hearts. It is prayer to the great physician to heal the soul that will bring the blessing of God. Prayer unites us with one another and with God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives new strength and fresh grace to the fainting, perplexed soul to overcome the world, to overcome the flesh and the devil. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. Prayer to the great physician for the healing of the soul brings the blessing of God. Prayer unites us to one another and to God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives new strength and fresh grace to the perplexed soul. By prayer, the sick have been encouraged to believe that God will look with compassion upon them. A ray of light penetrates to the hopeless soul and becomes a savor of life unto life. <coughs> Church, prayer has subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched Quench the violence of fire. Prayer brings increased spiritual strength, and strength and grace can be found in prayer. And we must always remember that even in a brief prayer, there is spiritual power. It's prayer time. And today, the focus on the family is Dylan Steele. I know I saw him this morning. Come on up, son. <laughs> my spirits. 
because there could have been a lot of things that he could have asked for, material and worldly things. But what he won from God is wisdom and understanding. And we know that God was truly blessed by Solomon's request, and he granted it. And I know God is going to grant this for our son here. But is there anything else that going to do something different. This is a young man, and my heart goes out to our young adults. Yes, so you know what I'm about to ask <coughs> for all of our young babies to come on, march on up here. Yes. And I'm going to have to stop for a moment because I believe there is some inside of here. And I feel in my heart that God wants them also to be a part of this prayer. I need you guys to step out here to the sanctuary for prayer. It's prayer time. And I have a Lord God, that they are loved, 
you might need to come around right now and wrap your arms around some individual child right here that is seeking you who have been going through some serious things throughout this week, Father God. I don't know what they're going through, Lord, but I know that you know and I know that you will show them that you will bring them through. You are a God of restoration. You are a God of healing. What you want most is for your children to come before your feet and seek your face earnestly in prayer. Lord, show them that you're there for them. Give them that desire to seek you daily, Father God. I'm crying out for our youth, Lord. We love them, Lord, and our black men, Father God. We need your support. We need your love, and it needs to be shown, Father God. Give them the wisdom that they need, Lord. Open up and reveal your word to them, Father God. Pour out your power through your Holy Spirit and teach them. But Lord, we know that we must be willing to learn. I pray, Father God, that they have that desire within their hearts to truly want to get to know you. Father God, this is your church. This is your sanctuary. This is your tabernacle. Make each and every one of them feel at home when they step into these doors. Let them know that you are here waiting on them. You was at the door waiting on them, Father God. Open the door. Let them feel and see your presence. And let them know that this is their church too. That we are not leaving them out. That they can participate. That they can be a part of it, Father God. Take away the fear. Take away the nervousness. We have some children before you, Lord, that want to do things for you. They might not know how to go about it, Father God, but speak to them. Give them that courage like you did Daniel, Father God, so that they will know that they can come before you and you will use them as vessels, Lord. They too can be used no matter the age. No matter the age, they can be used, Father God. Lord, I pray for the lifetime. I pray for each family that is represented here today, Lord. Be with them as well. Deliver us. Heal us, Father God, whether it's financially, whether, whether it's in illness and sicknesses that we're going through, Father God. You know our situations, but we need healing, Father God. This whole church is, has come before the throne this morning seeking prayer, seeking guidance. Lord, I also want to lift up your manservant this know that your people need a word. You know that we need to hear a word from on high. Each and every one of us can leave today with a specific message from you, Lord, that involves us personally. And that is our prayer. All the way down to the five-year-olds. They can be blessed, Lord God. Bring your presence into the sanctuary. Pour your spirit out upon and speak through your manservant and bless us, Father God. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. We lift your name up on high. Lord, I cannot get up without coming before you and asking that you forgive us of our sins, cleanse us and purify us, and make us whole. Make us to be what you want us to be. It's a struggle, but you said pick up your cross daily and deny ourselves, and we will get the victory. Humanity with divinity cannot sin. And once we realize that and accept that, Father God, we will overcome. We praise your name. We lift you up on high. And we thank you for what you are about to do. Be with our children. Be with the lighthouse. Be with our members. Be with our man servant that's going to speak your word. This is our prayer. In the mighty, powerful name of Jesus, we pray that everyone say amen. and happy Sabbath, everyone. I understand this is a portion of meditation. So let's take this opportunity to meditate on the history of testimonies in our lives of what God has done. Oh. 
Someone had to ask you to write your final words, and this is what he said: Let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. I, I, I hope I'm, I'm not talking to the frozen chosen. Can I take my time with this? Can I talk to someone? Let everything that has breath. So if you check yourself and you get some breath in you, praise the Lord. Let's do that. Let's do that. Amen. Again, because he's worthy of our praise. To God be the glory for great things he has done. Amen. Amen. I tell you, I'll say the same thing I said last week. And I'll say the same thing next week. If you didn't feel anything when they were singing here, that's because you don't have anything. If your fire, if that does not light up your fire, you need to find some other kind of wood. Because your wood may be wet. But that's some praise and worship. Amen? Amen. I will bless the Lord. Help me, Lighthouse. Help me, help me, help me. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's praying shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear the love and be glad. Now, you can let me do it by myself, but let me say it as David said. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together because he is worthy, worthy of our praise. One more point and then I'm going to let Sister Tina go and sit down over there. You know, this, today actually, we started a new Sabbath school, right? Amen. And you know, we're reading about the great controversy. Amen. 
and the fall of Lucifer and all of that, right? And we learned that Lucifer had all these gifts that God has given him, right? She, had, she could sing four parts all by herself. Now, come on now. You know, one person put up a concert all by herself. You know, the soprano and tenor and bass and all, all by herself. But when she was kicked out of heaven, she lost all of that. And God allowed us to have that. She was able to sing praises to God, right? Now, we can do that. She was there, she had a percussion within her vocal cords. Now, we can do that with our hands. We can clap to God with that. She had all of that. Now, all of that is given unto us. So you know how you can make the, the devil so upset? Praise God. Praise. That's what you got to do. So now you're doing what he can do. So just do that. Just praise God. Just worship him in his goodness, in the beauty of his holiness. Because our God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Amen. He could be superintending some other planet somewhere. And then when you hear praise, thank you, Jesus. The Lord stopped what he's doing and looked down on planet Earth. When you hear somebody say hallelujah, he stops and looked down and says, who is that? Just praise him. Amen. After all, this is the day that the Lord has made. Not the mayor of this city, not the governor of this state. Surely not the president of this country. This is the day that the Lord has made. And so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Is that okay? Yeah, we have come here with some burdens and we are in the right place for that. Is that okay? This is the day and this is the place where we ought to be. Let us have a word of prayer and then we're going to get in the word. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Those things that we deserve but you held back. And then that grace that you gave us things that we didn't even deserve, God. But because of who you are, you just gave it to us. So we say thank you, God. Thank you for being a God that is good to us. If we heard a thousand times, we still couldn't praise you enough, God. If we heard until tomorrow and stay here, it wouldn't be enough, Lord. So we just want to ask you to accept our humble gratitude right now, God. Because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, you have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so have you separated our sins far from us. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we pray that you speak, Lord. Speak in the stillness while you wait. We as your servants are hushed and are listening with expectancy. Speak, O oh blessed Master, and let us hear your voice. And let us feel your touch, Lord, of power. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our scripture for today is coming from the book of Job. The book of Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, for those of you have, who have permitted your Bibles to accompany with you to this service, if you have regular Bible, old-fashioned, if you have an, a Bible app, you know, those with a Bible app, you, you can teach through it quick, you can get to it, you don't even to know the books of the Bible. You can just go to it and touch, right? So out of reverence, if you can all stand and we can read the scripture one more time, how long until daybreak? That's the question. How long until daybreak? Job chapter 7, we're going to read verse 4, and then we're going to skip to verse 14, verse 13 and 14. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you need me to wait, you can say wait for me. All right, we all have it. Job chapter 7, 
beginning with verse 4. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be gone? And I am full of tossings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. And then we go to verse 13. When I say, my bed shall comfort me, my cot shall ease my complaints. Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifies me through visions. May the Lord bless the reading and the doing of his word for God's people. You can have a seat. Amen. Amen. How long until daybreak? How long until daybreak? When you read the account of the life of Job, most of us have read about it. If you've been in the church for about five or seven minutes, you've heard about Job. When you read the account of the book of Job and the life of Job, you find out that it's an intriguing account. Because on one hand, it juxtaposed the God that we hear and we've learned, right? And the life that we aspire to live. A holy life. A perfect life. Don't be afraid of that word perfect. It simply means maturity. Spiritual maturity, that is. A perfect life. So you see here there's a God that we serve, right? And then on the other side, there is Job. That the Bible says in Job chapter 1, I want to read it exactly. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil, meaning he avoided evil. That's the kind of testimony we all want to have, don't we? When someone talks about you, they say, man, you know, Brother Dan, yes, that's the man that loves God. He, he loves God, he avoids evil, he loves his family. That's the kind of testimony you want someone to have and to say about you. So when you read about Job, when you learn about Job, that's what you find out about him. He was the kind of a man that loved God. But in this situation, you see that he is beset with calamities, right? He is beset with what we call vicissitude, the trials and the tribulations of life. He is beset by what you and I have just gone through this week. You wake up in the morning, uh, Brother Elder Barnes and I were talking about this uh, before we came out. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you know, the first thing you need to do, you know, you thank God for another day, right? Before your feet touch the ground, your knees touch the ground, right? You ask, you ask God for provision for a new day. You submit yourself. You ask God to guide you. You know why you do that? Because He is omnipresent. So this is Saturday, right? So when you wake up tomorrow morning by God's grace, God is already in the tomorrow before you get there. So it's just wise if I'm making my way to Kansas City and somebody has been through to Kansas City, right? to find out how to get to Kansas City. So God is already there before you get there. And so you wake up in the morning, you commit yourself to Him sincerely, you go to work, and before 8 o'clock hits, somebody on your job just gets on your nerves, right? If you're a school teacher, you know, some kid get on your nerves. If you're someone who, anywhere you are, even at home, somebody can get on your nerves. And you say to yourself, man, I just pray. As a matter of fact, I may be fasting and praying today. That does not exempt you from going through stuff. So Job, the Bible says, he was a man that loved God. Not only did he love God, he was a wise man. I know he was wise because the Bible says he avoided evil. Can I fast forward to, to Psalm chapter 1? When you read Psalm chapter 1, it starts like this. Blessed is the man that walks not in the way of sinners, right? No, uh, in the castle of the ungodly, right? No, standeth in the way of sinners, no, in the seat of the scornful. Because that's how sin starts. First of all, you start walking. And then walking gets so good, you get comfortable, you start standing. And then standing gets so comfortable, before you know it, you're sitting. 
that's what Peter did. You know, last week we talked about Good Friday. And Peter went to warm up his hands on the wrong kind of fire. Before he knew it, he was sitting, he was comfortable. Until he was outed by the little girl, right? He said, man, you don't belong here. Even the way you talk, you talk like them Adventist talk. <laughs> All right, that's another sermon. But I said, Job was a wise man because he avoided evil. You know, the Bible, uh, Paul was talking to Timothy and he gave him some sound advice. And he says, Timothy, flee youthful lust. You know, see, Dr. C.D. Brooks, the late C.D. Brooks used to say, some people crawl from temptation hoping it will catch up with them instead of running from temptation. you got to be like Joseph, brother. Run, Forrest, run, you know? You put on your Nikes and just take off. And so Job was a wise man. I know, you know the way it's Saturday, we don't talk about movies like that, but it makes a point, yeah? Run! So Mr. Job used to avoid evil. He sees evil on this side, he walks the other way. You know? I heard the late Billy Graham used to be, when he was evangelizing, he would travel all around the world. One of the principles he made for himself, he said, man, when he was away from his wife, he was never found standing or with another woman all by himself. He just made it upon himself. It didn't mean that the other lady could be evil or conniving or anything. He said just, I don't trust me. <laughs> you know? So we, the two of us are going in the elevator. No, you, you can go ahead. I'll take the next one. That's just wisdom, you know what I'm saying? Now, Job avoided evil. And I'm saying this to young people. I'm saying this to all the ones alike. Don't feel like you are so tough that you, you can stand the devil. No, you are no match for the devil. If he could take one third of the angels from a perfect heaven, right? Who do you think you are? You have been dwarfed by sin. You have been just pillaged by sin. You have been victimized, so we are no match of the devil. Now, through Jesus, we are more than conquerors, right? But Job avoided evil. That's what the Bible said. Now, life was going well for Mr. Job. Until one day, the Bible said, Lucifer showed up. You know, he always shows up where he's not supposed to be present, right? He shows up in God has a conversation with Lucifer. And it was God. Remember this now. The first thing that we learn in this book of Job is, do the righteous suffer? See, you're ahead of me now. Do the righteous suffer? And he will get to it. Because in this situation, you find out that Job suffers a calamity, right? First thing is, he loses 7,000 sheep. 7,000. Just like that. Gone. And then we lose 3,000 camels. Gone. Just like that. And then we lose 500 yoke of oxen. Gone. Just like that. And then we lose 500 female donkeys. Gone. Just like that. And then we lose 7 sons. In one day. Gone. And then he lose three daughters in one day. Gone. That's ten children. Can you imagine that? Ten children in one day. Ten caskets at a funeral. Ten graves you have to dig. Now that sounds like a calamity to me. Right? And then the affinity and the affection of his wife look like it's gone. And then the reputation that he had in the city, it looked like it's gone. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the, 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 the companionship that he had with the, his so-called friends, right? The three so-called friends, I'll say that. That also seems gone. You know the friends, right? What are their names? Elphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. You don't need to know all their names, but there are three fake friends. You know, you can have fake friends and real enemies in life, right? And these were the ones. So, he's going through all of that. That, to me, sounds like a calamity. And it begs the question, do the righteous suffer? Do the innocent suffer? 
And you answer the question, of course, yes. And I know it is because Jesus said that. When you read John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you all this that you might have peace. Because in this life, you shall suffer tribulation. He said, trouble is going to come, guaranteed. Money back guaranteed. You are going to have tribulation. But that's why I love the parts of the Bible. He didn't stop there. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Give him a big hand. He said, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. So we see here that Job is suffering. Not because of anything he did. And here's something so intriguing. Because when the devil shows up before God, it is not the devil that brings up Job in the conversation. It is God that brings Job in the conversation. And God, now this is unbeknown to Job now. He doesn't know all of this. You and I have the benefit right now. We can read this. But in the time when all this was happening, he was clueless. Right? And so God brings up Job in the conversation. He says, hey, he asked the devil, you know, what have you been doing? And you know the devil, you know, I say, hey, man, I've been, I've been going to and fro, window shopping. <laughs> I've been just doing some window shopping. And I saw your servant, and, and, and uh, pause, I'm sorry. God said, have you seen my servant, Job? Do you know that God brags about us? <laughs> Read the book of Malachi. He said, when we talk about God, when we do things, he said, it's written in the book of remembrance. So there is a conversation that's, that's, that's going on in heaven about us. Remember when Jesus warned what you do to the little ones? Yeah. What did he say? Because he said, the angels that protects them behold the face of my Father in heaven. Yes. So there's always a conversation about us. So even when you're all alone, you are not alone. Because somebody's talking about you. They're talking behind your back. But they're talking about you behind your back in a good way. And so God was talking about Job behind his back in a good way. He said, have you seen my servant Job? He's faithful. That's awesome. Just think about that for a moment. This is the God of the universe saying, that's my first for seven right there. And you know, what, you know what the devil, he's always presumptuous. So you know what the devil say, right? He said, oh, you know, you think he's serving you just for nothing? Huh? He is one of those missionary believers. You know what a missionary is, right? That's a deal, the guy, the guy that's a, a wheel dealer, you know? I'll do this because you're going to do this for me, right? They are doing things for gain. And so the devil said, he's doing that simply because he's expecting something from you. Now I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you what you ought to do. This is the devil making a proposition to God. <laughs> Read it. It's in your Bible unless you tore it up. It's in there. <laughs> so the devil is talking to God. He said, I'll tell you what you ought to do. Take the hedge from around him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't go past, past that so fast. Take a hedge? How do you know he has a hedge? <laughs> That's because the enemy, the devil, tried to get to Job. Couldn't get to him. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. That's right. Let me, let me, let me, let me put a little disclaimer before we go on with this service. This, this sermon is on pause right now. Feel free to say thank you, Jesus, to say hallelujah, to say praise God at any time when I'm preaching. Because I have no problem with you doing that. Is that all right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, Brother Keith. So, wait a minute. How did you know? How did the devil know that Job had a hedge around him? It begs a question, doesn't it? That's because he tried to get to him. I wouldn't know you have an alarm system in your house unless I try to get to. And if, especially if I'm, I'm so specific, I say, oh, I can't go to Sister Adrian's house because uh, she has an ADT security system. Wait a minute, how do you know that? <laughs> you know, you may be a prophet, brother, but, you know. So he said, take the hedge. This is the devil, you know, don't take the hedge around. Take the hedge from it. Take the hedge from him. Can I give you a word, brothers and sisters? Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. For those of you who are Bible readers and scholars, you can write that down or you can memorize it. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. Here's what the Bible says. This is one of my favorite Bible scriptures. Every day when I go before God, it's like I go before the ATM machine. 
I have to remind God about what he said. Psalm chapter 5 verse 12, he says that, that the righteous are surrounded with favor as a shield. Okay. Come on now. Right. You should have said amen to that one. You should have looked at man if you can't say amen. Can I say it again one more time? It just sounded good coming out of that. The righteous are surrounded with favor as a shield. Is it in your Bible? It's in there. That means you. That means you. That means all of us. The righteous. And you know what makes us righteous? It's Christ's righteousness covering us. That's it. Got nothing to do with you and I. It's imputed and imparted righteousness. So the devil makes a proposition. He moves. He says, now you move the hedge from around him. And then, the first thing he did, he didn't even ask for Job's life. He didn't ask for that. He just said, take his stuff away from him. Just take the stuff from him and then he will cast to your face. You see how much the devil knows about us? He knows how much attached we are to stuff. I'm just talking about stuff. I didn't say life. Just stuff. You know, you say, yeah, he's driving that. You name it, you know the car you're driving. He's driving that, she's driving that. Just let it break down. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, throw, let me just blow up that, 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 that whatever. The, 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 what, what do you call it? Any mechanic in the house? Blow the engine. Just let me, let me blow the engine out. And let me see what he will do. Let me see what she will do. That's how presumptuous. And the reason he did that, because he worked in the past. And the devil does not reinvent the wheel. And so he said, you take the stuff out, you remove the things that are so dear to him, and see what he will do. And God says, you move. Because, because God knows the material he's working with. You know, God knows us. And so he said, you go ahead and do that. I'll remove the head, but don't touch it. Aren't you glad that we serve a God like that? Aren't you glad? He said, no, this is just how far you can go. Amen. But don't touch him. Right. And then he did that. So, you know, the calamity I just described, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 oxen, 5,000 donkeys, 7 sons, 3 daughters, gone. Not in 2 days, not in 3 days, in 1 day. Can you imagine getting that kind of a phone call? You got a daughter in college, you get that kind of call. And then your son is in high school, you get that kind of a phone call. And then your other son is in elementary school, you get that kind of a phone call in one day. So that's what happened here. So the question was, do the righteous suffer? And the, question, the answer is yes. Yes, they suffer. Do they suffer because of anything that they've done necessarily? No. Not necessarily. And if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I think it's verse 3, the Bible says, all things happen to all people. Yes. To all people. You know, the Bible says, the sun shines to the just and it rains to the just and there. Just make sure you're on the just side of things, right? Just make sure of that. But it rains and it shines to heaven. To each life, and some rain is going to fall. And so in Job's life, we see here that he's suffering and he's innocent. And then another thing that you learn here is, so when he's suffering and he's innocent, his friends, his so-called friend shows up, right? Yes. And they start getting on him. And the Bible helps us to answer this bad theology. And by the way, let me pause here and talk to the proponents and the false prophets of prosperity gospel. You know, they, 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 they name it and claim it, take it home and frame it, you know, that kind of stuff, that as long as you live right, nothing's going to happen to you. You don't believe how many people are deceived by that today, that as long as you live right, you know, you come, or you come over here and I'll, I'll have a little basket like this, and you sow a seed, coming to think about it, no, that's a bad idea, but you know, think about it. Sowing a seed, you know, you come and you sow a seed, right? And you, as long as you're living right, you can go home 
And all your bills are going to be paid. All your sickness is going to be healed. That's a lie from hell itself. Yes, it is. Because we see here that no matter how well you live, that does not prevent you from experiencing tribulation. But the friends come in. Now, the brother is already on the ground, right? They say you can't kick a dead horse to death. He's already dead. But they show up. Zophar, Bildad, and the other brother. They show up and they start talking to him. They say, you know what? We knew there was nothing about what you were talking about. We knew you were fake. We know you are phony. You know, if you are living right, how come all of these are happening? Now, when you read Job chapter 4, that's when you see, especially this brother by the name of Bildad, or no, Elphaz, he's really hammering on Job now. And he's talking to him, you know, talking about how a hypocrite he is. You must have been doing something wrong, right? Because wickedness, you know, wicked people receive wickedness. That's what he, he said. And sinful people receive sinfulness. So if you are sinful, then you reap what you sow. But we come to see here that he did not suffer because he was wicked. He suffered because he had no idea that there was a conversation that took place and something was happening behind the scene. Right? But here's the mistake that Job made. His suffering was extended. His suffering was protracted because he tried to justify himself before God. And he tried to do that because of his friend's influence. Because they came to him and they challenged him. He felt the need now to start challenging God, right? And he said, you know how we are. Lord, I've been, I've, been going, I've, been, I've been showing up every Tuesday at 6.30 at Connect. I've been in a prayer meeting every week. I've been returning a faithful tithe and offering every week. Right? I have, I've been, I have an Adventist wife. I have an Adventist home. I'm driving an Adventist car. I'm eating an Adventist food. I'm walking like an Adventist too. Try to justify it himself. And he got in trouble. And you know, when you try to do that, God says, all right, you want to talk to me? You want to show yourself with this holy righteousness and this sanctimonious self? I'll let you suffer for a little bit. And so his suffering was extended. It could have been truncated. It could have been shortened. But it was extended because he tried to justify himself. Don't ever go before God and try to justify yourself. And here's why, because Romans 3.23 says, I have some Bible readers in the class, right? All have sinned. It doesn't say, y'all have sinned. It says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? So there's nothing that you can carry before God and justify yourself. But Job tried to do that. And in the process of doing that, he extended the pain. He extended it. But there's something... Again, that you have to remember about yourself. You have to remember about yourself. I have to remember about myself. That even at my best, I'm still a mess. Yes, we are. Yes, I am. Even at my best, I am still a mess. Right? So we see here that even, the, even though the Bible calls Job righteous and an upright man, he's still came short of the glory of God. And you see, he tried to explain himself, he tried to justify himself, but we have to remember that, that even in our best, we are still a mess before God. All we have to do is stay humble. The Bible said in Proverbs 18.22, that before honor is humility. Always stay humble. You don't have to justify yourself. God already knows who you are. Amen? Even if people don't know who you are, God knows who you are.
worthy. He is worthy of all our praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Only you. That's what the song was about. Only you. That's what Brother Keith and Sister Adrian sang about. Only you. Okay, maybe I'll talk to this side over here. He say, only you. He's worthy of our praise. Can I talk to someone on this side right here? Say, only you. Only you. He's worthy of our praise. Amen. When I think about the goodness of Jesus. This is, not a, this is not just a repetition of words for me. This is real for me. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank God. Praise God for saving me. Amen. 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 Last time I read in Psalm 150, David has written 149 psalms, right? And he was closing in and he said, can you imagine if someone had to ask you to write your final words? And this is what he said, let everything that has breath I'm not talking to the frozen chosen. No. <laughs> Can I take my time with this? Elder? Can I talk to someone? Let everything that has breath. So if you check yourself and you got some breath in you, praise the Lord. Let's do that. Let's do that. Amen. Again, because he's worthy of our praise. To God be the glory for great things. He has done. Amen? Amen. Amen. I tell you, I'll say the same thing I said last week. And I'll say the same thing next week. If you didn't feel anything when they were singing here, that's because you don't have anything. If your fire, if that does not light up your fire, you need to find some other kind of wood. Because your wood may be wet. But that's some praise and worship. Amen? Amen. I will bless the Lord. Make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear the Lord and be glad. Now, you can let me do it by myself, but let me say it as David said Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together because he is worthy, worthy of our praise. One more point and then I'm going to let Sister Tina go and sit down over there. You know, this. Today, actually, we started a new Sabbath school, early, right? Amen. And you know, we're reading about the great controversy right. and the fall of Lucifer and all of that, right? right? And we learned that Lucifer had all these gifts that God has given him, right? right. She, had, she could sing four parts all by herself. Now, come on now. You, you know, one person put up a concert all by herself. You know, the soprano and tenor and bass and all, all by herself. But when she was kicked out of heaven, she lost all of that. And God allowed us to have that. She was able to sing praises to God, right? Now we can do that. She was there, she had a percussion within her vocal cords. Now we can do that with our hands. We can clap to God with that. She had all of that. Now all of that is given unto us. So you know how you can make the, the devil so upset? Praise God. That's what you gotta do. God. Just worship Him in His goodness, in the beauty of His holiness, because our God inhabits the praises of His people. Amen? He could be superintending some other planet somewhere, and then when you hear praise, thank you, Jesus, the Lord stops what He's doing and looks down on planet Earth. When you hear somebody say, Hallelujah! He stops and looks down and says, who is that? Just praise him. Amen? Amen. After all, this 
is the day that the Lord has made. Not the mayor of this city, not the governor of this state, surely not the president of this country. This is the day that the Lord has made. And so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Is that okay? Yeah, we may have come here with some burdens and we are in the right place for that. Is that okay? This is the day and this is the place where we ought to be. Let us have a word of prayer and then we're going to get in the word. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Those things that we deserve but you held back. And then that grace that you gave us things that we didn't even deserve, God. But because of who you are, you just give it to us. So we say thank you, God. Thank you for being a God that is good to us. If we heard a thousand times, we still couldn't praise you enough, God. If we heard until tomorrow and stay here, it wouldn't be enough, Lord. So we just want to ask you to accept our humble gratitude right now, God. Because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, you have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so have you separated our sins far from us. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we pray that you speak, Lord. Speak in the stillness while you wait. We as your servants are hushed and are listening with expectancy. Speak, O oh blessed Master, and let us hear your voice, and let us feel your touch, Lord, of power. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our scripture for today is coming from the book of Job. The book of Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7, for those of you who have who have permitted your Bibles to accompany with you to this service. If you have a regular Bible, old-fashioned, if you have an, a Bible app, you know, those with a Bible app, you, you can teach through it quick. You can get to it. You don't even to know the books of the Bible. You can just go to it and touch, right? So out of reverence, if you can all stand and we can read the scripture one more time. How long until daybreak? That's the question. How long until daybreak? Job chapter 7. We're going to read verse 4. And then we're going to skip to verse 14. Verse 13 and 14. If you have you say amen. amen. If you need me to wait, you can say wait for me. Alright, we all have it. Job chapter 7. Beginning with verse 4. When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be gone? And I am full of tossings to and fro unto the dawning of the day. And then we go to verse 13. When I say, My bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaints. Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifies me through visions. May the Lord bless the reading and the doing of his word for God's people. You can have a seat. Amen. How long until daybreak? How long until daybreak? When you read the account of the life of Job, most of us have read about it. If you've been in the church for about five or seven minutes, you've heard about Job. When you read the account of the book of Job and the life of Job, you find out that it's an intriguing account. Because on one hand, it juxtaposes the God that we hear and we've learned, right? And the life that we aspire to live. A holy life, a perfect life, 
Don't be afraid of that word perfect. It simply means maturity. Spiritual maturity, that is. A perfect life. So you see here there's a God that we serve, right? And then on the other side, there is Job. That the Bible says in Job chapter 1, I want to read it exactly. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil, meaning he avoided evil. That's the kind of testimony we all want to have, don't we? When someone talks about you, they say, man, you know, brother Dan, yes, that's the man that loves God. He, he loves God, he avoids evil, he loves his family. That's the kind of testimony you want someone to have and to say about you. So when you read about Job, when you learn about Job, that's what you find out about him. He was the kind of a man that loved God. But in this situation, you see that he's beset with calamities, right? He is beset with what we call vicissitude, the trials and the tribulations of life. He is beset by what you and I have just gone through this week. You wake up in the morning, uh, Brother Elder Barnes and I were talking about this uh, before we came out. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you know, the first thing you need to do, you know, you thank God for another day, right? Before your feet touch the ground, your knees touch the ground, right? You ask, you ask God for provision for a new day. You submit yourself. You ask God to guide you. You know why you do that? Because He is omnipresent. So this is Saturday, right? So when you wake up tomorrow morning by God's grace, God is already in the tomorrow before you get there. So it's just wise if I'm making my way to Kansas City and somebody has been through to Kansas City, right? To find out how to get to Kansas City. So God is already there before you get there. And so you wake up in the morning, you commit yourself to Him sincerely. You go to work and before 8 o'clock hits, somebody on your job just gets on your nerves, right? If you're a school teacher, you know, some kid get on your nerves. If you're someone who, anywhere you are, even at home, somebody can get on your nerves. And you say to yourself, man, I just pray. As a matter of fact, I may be fasting and praying today. That does not exempt you from going through stuff. So Job, the Bible says, he was a man that loved God. Not only did he love God, he was a wise man. I know he was wise because the Bible says he avoided evil. Can I fast forward to, to Psalm chapter 1? When you read Psalm chapter 1, it starts like this. Blessed is the man that walks not in the way of sinners, right? No, uh, in the counsel of the ungodly, right? No, standeth in the way of sinners, no, in the seat of the scornful. Because that's how sin starts. First of all, you start walking. And then walking gets so good, you get comfortable, you start standing. And then standing gets so comfortable, before you know it, you're sitting. That's what Peter did. You know, last week we talked about Good Friday. And Peter went to warm up his hands on the wrong kind of fire. Before he knew it, he was sitting, he was comfortable. Until he was outed by the little girl, right? He said, man, you don't belong here. Even the way you talk, you talk like them Adventist talk. <laughs> All right, that's another sermon. But I said, Job was a wise man because he avoided evil. You know, the Bible, uh, Paul was talking to Timothy and he gave him some sound advice. And it says, Timothy, flee youthful lust. Amen. You know, Dr. City Brooks, the late City Brooks, used to say, some people crawl from temptation hoping it will catch up with them instead of running from temptation. you got to be like Joseph, brother. Run, boys, run, you know? You put on your Nikes and just take off. And so Job was a wise man. I know, you know the way it's Saturday, we don't talk about movies like that, but it makes a point, yeah? Run! So Mr. Job used to avoid evil. He sees evil on this side, he walks the other way. You know? I heard the late Billy Graham used to be, when he was evangelizing, he would travel all around the world. One of the principles he made for himself, he said, man, when he was away from his wife, he was never found standing with another woman all by himself. He just made it upon himself. 
It didn't mean that the other lady could be evil or conniving or anything. He said, just, I don't trust me. <laughs> you know? So we, the two of us are going in the elevator. No, you, you can go ahead. I'll take the next one. That's just wisdom. You know what I'm saying? Now, Job avoided evil. And I'm saying this to young people. I'm saying this to all the ones alike. Don't feel like you are so tough that you, you can stand the devil. No, you are no match for the devil. If he could take one third of the angels from a perfect heaven, right? Who do you think you are? You have been dwarfed by sin. You have been just pillaged by sin. You have been victimized. So we are no match of the devil. Now through Jesus, we are more than conquerors, right? But Job avoided evil. That's what the Bible said. Now, life was going well for Mr. Job. Until one day, the Bible said, Lucifer showed up. You know, he always shows up where he's not supposed to be present, right? He shows up and God has a conversation with Lucifer. And it was God. Remember this now. The first thing that we learn in this book of Job is, do the righteous suffer? See, you're ahead of me now. Do the righteous suffer? And he will get to it. Because in this situation, you find out that Job suffers a calamity, right? First thing is he loses 7,000 sheep. 7,000. Just like that, gone. And then he loses 3,000 camels. Gone, just like that. And then he loses 500 yoke of oxen. Gone. Just like that. And then he lose 500 female donkeys. Gone. Just like that. And then he lose seven sons. In one day. Gone. And then he lose three daughters. In one day. Gone. That's ten children. Can you imagine that? Ten children in one day. Ten caskets at a funeral. Ten graves you have to dig. Now, that sounds like a calamity to me, right? And then the affinity and the affection of his wife look like it's gone. And then the reputation that he had in the city, it looked like it's gone. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the, 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 the companionship that he had with the, his so-called friends, right? The three so-called friends, I'll say that. That also seems gone. You know the friends, right? What are their names? Elphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. You don't need to know all their names, but there are three fake friends. You know, you can have fake friends and real enemies in life, right? And these were the ones. So he's going through all of that. That, to me, sounds like a calamity. And it begs the question, do the righteous suffer? Do the innocent suffer? And you answer the question, of course, yes. And I know it is because Jesus said that. When you read John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I've told you all this that you might have peace. Because in this life, you shall suffer tribulation. He said, trouble is going to come, guaranteed. Money back guaranteed. You are going to have tribulation. But... That's why I love the parts of the Bible. He didn't stop there. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Give him a big hand. He said, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. So we see here that Job is suffering. Not because of anything he did. And here's something so intriguing. Because when the devil shows up before God, it is not the devil that brings up Job in the conversation. It is God that brings Job in the conversation. And God, now this is unbeknown to Job now. He doesn't know all of this. You and I have the benefit right now. We can read this. But in the time when all this was happening, he was clueless. Right? And so God brings up Job in the conversation. Hey, he asked the devil, what have you been doing? And you know the devil, and I say, hey, man, I've been, I've been going to and fro, window shopping. I've been just doing some window shopping. And I saw your servant, and, and, and uh, 
Pause, I'm sorry. God says, have you seen my servant Job? Do you know that God brags about us? <laughs> Read the book of Malachi. He says, when we talk about God, when we do things, he says, it's written in the book of remembrance. So there is a conversation that's, that's, that's going on in heaven about us. Remember when Jesus warned what you do to the little ones? Yeah. What did he say? Because he said, the angels that protects them behold the face of my Father in heaven. Yes. So there's always a conversation about us. So even when you're all alone, you are not alone. Because somebody's talking about you. They're talking behind your back. But they're talking about you behind your back in a good way. And so God was talking about Job behind his back in a good way. He said, have you seen my servant Job? He's faithful. That's awesome. Just think about that for a moment. This is the God of the universe saying, that's my first for seven right there. And you know what, you know what the devil, he's always presumptuous. So you know what the devil say, right? He said, oh, you know, you think he's serving you just for nothing? Huh? He is one of those mercenary believers. You know what a mercenary is, right? That's a deal, the guy, the guy that's a, a wheel dealer, you know? I'll do this because you're going to do this for me, right? They are doing things for gain. And so the devil said, he's doing that simply because he's expecting something from you. Now I'll tell you what to do. I'll tell you what you ought to do. This is the devil making a proposition to God. <laughs> Read it. It's in your Bible unless you tore it up. It's in there. <laughs> so the devil is talking to God. He said, I'll tell you what you ought to do. Take the hedge from around him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't go past, past that so fast. Take a hedge? How do you know he has a hedge? That's because the enemy, the devil, tried to get to Job. Couldn't get to him. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. That's right. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me put a little disclaimer before we go on with this service. This, this sermon is on pause right now. Feel free to say thank you, Jesus, to say hallelujah, to say praise God at any time when I'm preaching. Because I have no problem with you doing that. Is that all right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, Brother King. So, wait a minute. How did you know? How did the devil know that Job had a hedge around him? It begs a question, doesn't it? That's because he tried to get to him. I wouldn't know you have an alarm system in your house unless I try to get to. And if, especially if I'm, I'm so specific, I say, oh, I can't go to Sister Adrian's house because uh, she has an ADT security system. Wait a minute, how do you know that? You know, you may be a prophet, brother, but, you know. So he said, take the hedge. This is the devil, you know, take, take the hedge around. Take the hedge from it. Take the hedge from it. Can I give you a word, brothers and sisters? Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. For those of you who are Bible readers and scholars, you can write that down or you can memorize it. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. Here's what the Bible says. This is one of my favorite Bible scriptures. Every day when I go before God, it's like I go before the ATM machine. I have to remind God about what he said. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12, he says that, that the righteous are surrounded with favor as a shield. Okay. Come on now. Right. You should have said amen to that word. You should have looked amen if you can't say amen. Can I say it again one more time? It just sounded good coming out. You know, the righteous are surrounded with favor as a shield. Is it in your Bible? It's in there. That means you. That means you. That means all of us. The righteous. And you know what makes us righteous? It's Christ's righteousness covering us. That's it. Got nothing to do with you and I. It's imputed and imparted righteousness. So the devil makes a proposition. He moves. He says, now you move the hedge from around him. And then, the first thing he did, he didn't even ask for Job's life. He didn't ask for that. He just said, take his stuff away from him. Just take the stuff from him and then he will cast to your face. You see how much the devil knows about us? He knows how much attached we are to stuff. I'm just talking about stuff. I didn't say life. Just stuff. You know, we say, yeah, he's driving that. 
You name it, you know the car you're driving. He's driving that, she's driving that. Just let it break down. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me just blow up that, 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 whatever. The, 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 what, what do you call it? Any mechanic in the house? Blow the engine. Just let me, let me blow the engine out. And let me see what he will do. Let me see what she will do. That's how presumptuous. And the reason he did that, because he worked in the past. And the devil does not reinvent the wheel. So he said, you take the stuff out. You remove the things that are so dear to him. And see what he will do. And God says, you move. Because, because God knows the material he's working with. Yeah. You know, God knows us. Yeah. And so he said, you go ahead and do that. I'll remove the head, but don't touch it. Aren't you glad that we serve a God like that? Yeah. Aren't you glad? He said, no, this is just how far you can go. Amen. But don't touch him. And then he did that. So, you know, the calamity I just described, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 oxen, 5,000 donkeys, 7 sons, 3 daughters, gone. Not in 2 days, not in 3 days, in 1 day. Can you imagine getting that kind of a phone call? You got a daughter in college, you get that kind of call. And then your son is in high school, you get that kind of a phone call. And then your other son is in elementary school, you get that kind of a phone call in one day. So that's what happened here. So the question was, do the righteous suffer? And the, question, the answer is yes. Yes, they suffer. Do they suffer because of anything that they've done necessarily? No, not necessarily. And if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I think it's verse 3. The Bible says, all things happen to all people. Yes. To all people. You know, the Bible says, the sun shines to the just and it rains to the just and there. Just make sure you're on the just side of things, right? Just make sure of that. But it rains and it shines to heaven. To each life, and some rain is going to fall. And so in Job's life, we see here that He's suffering, and he's innocent. And then another thing that you learn here is, so when he's suffering and he's innocent, his friends, his so-called friend shows up, right? Yes. And they start getting on him. And the Bible helps us to answer this bad theology. And by the way, let me pause here and talk to the proponents and the false prophets of prosperity gospel. You know, they, 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 they name it and claim it, take it home and frame it you know that kind of stuff that as long as you live right nothing's gonna happen to you you don't believe how many people are deceived by that today that as long as you live right you know you come or you come over here and I'll, I'll have a little basket like this and you sow a seed coming to think about that now that's a bad idea but you know think about sowing a seed you know you come and you sow a seed right and you, as long as you're living right, you can go home and all your bills are going to be paid. All your sickness is going to be healed. That's a lie from hell itself. Yes, it is. Because we see here that no matter how well you live, that does not prevent you from experiencing tribulation. But the friends come in. Now, the brother is already on the ground, right? Yes. They say you can't kick a dead horse to death. He's already dead. <laughs> but they show up. Zophar, Bildad, and the other brother. They show up. And they start talking to him. They say, you know what? We knew there was nothing about what you were talking about. We knew you were fake. Yeah. We know you are phony. You know, if you are living right, how come all of these are happening? Now, when you read Job chapter 4, that's when you see, especially this brother by the name of Bildad, or no, Elphaz, he's really hammering on Job now. And he's talking to me, you know, talking about how a hypocrite he is. You must have been doing something wrong, right? Because wickedness, you know, wicked people receive wickedness, that's what he, he said. And sinful people receive sinfulness. So if you are sinful, then you reap what you sow. But we come to see here that he did not suffer because he was wicked. He suffered because he had no idea 
that there was a conversation that took place and something was happening behind the scene. Right? But here's the mistake that Job made. His suffering was extended. His suffering was protracted because he tried to justify himself before God. And he tried to do that because of his friend's influence. Because they came to him and they challenged him. He felt the need now to start challenging God, right? And he said, you know how we are. Lord, I've been, I've, been going, I've, been, I've been showing up every Tuesday at 6.30 at Connect. I've been at prayer meeting every week. I've been returning a faithful tithe and offering every week. Right? I have, I've been, I have an Adventist wife. I have an Adventist home. I'm driving an Adventist car. I'm eating an Adventist food. I'm walking like an Adventist too. Try to justify it himself. And he got in trouble. And you know, when you try to do that, God says, all right, you want to talk to me? You want to show yourself with this holy righteousness and this sanctimonious self? I'll let you suffer for a little bit. And so his suffering was extended. It could have been truncated. It could have been shortened. But it was extended because he tried to justify himself. Don't ever go before God and try to justify yourself. And here's why. Because Romans 3.23 says, I have some Bible readers in the class, right? All have sinned. It doesn't say y'all have sinned. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? So there's nothing that you can carry before God and justify yourself. But Job tried to do that. And in the process of doing that, he extended the pain. He extended it. But there's something, again, that you have to remember about yourself. You have to remember about yourself. I have to remember about myself. That even at my best, I'm still a mess. Yes, we are. Yes, I am. Even at my best, I am still a mess. Right? Mm -hmm. So we see here that even, the, even though the Bible called Job righteous mm -hmm. and an upright man, he still came short of the glory of God. Amen. And you see, he tried to explain himself, he tried to justify himself, but we have to remember that, that even in our best, we are still a mess before God. All we have to do is stay humble. The Bible said in Proverbs 18.22, that before honor is humility. Always stay humble. You don't have to justify yourself. God already knows who you are. Okay. Amen? Amen? Even if people don't know who you are, God knows who you are. And He will fight your battles. He will fight your battles. He will fight your battles. And the third, one more thing I want to talk about is suffering. Remember that suffering can be redemptive. Amen. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther King, whom we celebrated uh, last Tuesday, he used to say, unearned suffering, unmerited suffering is redemptive. Mm -hmm. Look at Calvary. Suffering is redemptive. Amen. Amen. And then another thing we can get out of this is suffering is educative. Mm -hmm. That you can learn something through suffering. Amen. How, can I, how can I prove that? Look at the end of the book of Job in Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, verse 5, you see Job talking, and he, this is what he said. He says, I have heard about you. Come on now, somebody help me. I have heard about you, but I've heard about you before, but now I see you. Amen? With my own eyes. Now I see you. Suffering is educative. It teaches you something. Yes. David said in Psalm 119 verse 71, he said, it was good for me Amen. that I was afflicted, yes. that I might learn your statutes. You know, I would have known, I would have known that God can heal somebody yes. except that I got sick right. and I prayed to him. Yes. I would have known that God can comfort somebody until when I lost somebody. Some of you have lost your loved ones. Yeah. And some of you never believed that you would stop crying. Mm. I know you did. I lost a brother and a sister. I know you, you are in that position. You, you don't think the day will come. Mm -hmm. But then as Psalm 3 verse 3 says, 
He's not only my glory and my shield, but He's my He's the lift of my head. Can I say that one more time? He is our glory. He is our shield and the lift of our head. Amen. So suffering is educative. You learn something and something about God. You learn that He can heal you when you're sick. You learn that He can comfort you when you are bowed down with grief. Oh, you learn that He is a way maker when you're broke. And broke ain't fun. Can I get a witness? Amen. But you know that He is a way maker. But you won't know it until you ran out of options. And then out of nowhere. Can I, can I just get a witness? Has God made a way for you? Yeah. My brother stood right here and he was singing and he said, not only the doors that you close, but the doors that you open. Yeah. And not only the doors that you open, but the ones that you close. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So he's a way maker, but you wouldn't know that until the time came when you needed somebody to wait, yeah. to make a way for you. Yeah. Amen. You wouldn't know that he's a burden share. Unless you are burdened down with some heavy load. Yes. And then you, you find out that he's the one who is carrying you the whole time. Yes. You thought there were two sets of footprints. Yes. And then you come to find out there's only one. Yes. And that one was his. Yes. Only you. Yes. Amen. Yes. So suffering is redemptive. Yes. And suffering is also yes. educative. But also suffering is purgative. It cleanses you. Yes, it does. It cleanses you. Because Job finally said, Though he tries me, he said, He knows my way. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, gold does not come out pure unless it goes through the crucible of fire. That's the, that's, the, that's the process of purification right there. And that's what suffering does. That sometimes God allows us to go through the crucibles of suffering so that he can purify us. In the book, The Great Controversy, the servant of the Lord says, there will come a moment in, in these last days that God will allow us to go through the crucible of fire, through the trials and tribulations. And here's why. So that our earthliness might be purified. I'm calling that verbatim. That our earthliness might be purified. So that little murmuring and, and complaining that we do, God wants to purify us from that. You know? So what if one bill is not paid, but you have eight that has been paid? Praise God for the eight. And pray for the one that needs to be paid. Amen? Just one window in your car doesn't close. You got the other three closed. Praise God for that. Amen. Celebrate what you have. Instead of mourning for what you don't have. Amen. But you wouldn't go through. You wouldn't know that unless you go through it. Amen. Some of you have been through relationships. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Just look straight to me. You got to go home with him. You gotta go home with her. Look straight to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look to me. <laughs> but you know you are a better person today because of what you have been through before. It might not have been good. It might not have felt good. But because God took you through it, right? You are better as a person. You are even a better a companion to the person next to you as a result of that. And if you don't even have a companion, you will be a better companion to somebody in the future because of what God has taken you through, right? So suffering is not only redemptive, it's not only educative, but it's also targeted. So Job here, we read in Job chapter 7, he's wondering. He said, when I thought I will get some rest, I go to my bed and I'm tossing to and fro, looking, longing, hoping for daybreak. And he said, and when, when the night comes, right? When the night comes, 
I get these nightmares. That's what he says. He says these visions that terrifies me. And you know how when we get children, like children, they get nightmares, right? You hear a child as a good father or mother, you run to the next room, and sometimes you pick them up and hold them, right? And then you calm them down. But here's the good news. Nightmares only last for a night. That's it. They don't last forever. So Job finds out that nightmares only last for a night. I got one point I'd like to make with you, my brother and sister. And that is, never lose your desire for daybreak. Okay. Can I say that one more time? Yes. Never lose your desire for, for daybreak. And what's, what is desire? Desire is hope. Yeah. Oh yeah. You remember hope? We had hope in 2007, yeah. 2008. Yeah. You remember that? Those, those good days. Oh, yes. You remember that? Oh, those were the good days, right? Yes, we can. You remember that? If, if, if you have a brother or my sister who you are Hispanic, we used to say, si se puede, right? Yes, we can. Hope. Desire. But it's not just desire. It's desire accompanied with expectations of fulfillment. Desire that is accompanied with expectations of fulfillment. You are hoping, you are expecting that something is going to be fulfilled. So never lose your desire for daybreak. No matter what happens, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what I may go through right now, never lose your desire for daybreak. You may be tossing and turning. You may have to cry sometime, but never lose your desire for daybreak. Because tomorrow, as sure as there's God in heaven, the sun is going to shine. The sun is going to shine. On from the eastern horizon, that orange vessel is going to come out of his vaulted dome. It's going to make a truck all the way to its Pacific twilight. The sun is going to shine. But if you lose you are desire for daybreak. You know who you become with? You become like Mrs. Job. Because Mrs. Job lost her desire for daybreak. Can I prove it to you? She showed up to her husband. And this is what she said. It's in the Bible. She said, Do you, you mean to tell me? You, you mean to tell me you still trust God? After all that you have been through and I've been through, you mean to tell me you're still talking about God? You mean to tell me you're still holding on to your integrity about this God? Why don't you do this? She had a proposition. Now listen to me carefully if it sounds familiar to you. She said, why don't you help me somebody? Come on, you know the Bible. They say, why don't you do what? Cast God in? Does that sound familiar? Who said that in the first place? Satan said that, right? When he showed up before God, that's what he said. He said, now, you take the hedge because I have some folk. And I'm going back again. I have some folk that have what I call hedge religion. They can only worship God when they have a hedge around them. They can only praise him when there's a hedge around him. But I, I have a question for you. Can you still praise God without a hedge? Can you still worship him without a hedge? Can you still pray to him without a hedge? Can you still give a faithful tithe and offering without a hedge? Can you lift your hands in the sanctuary and say hallelujah to Jesus without the hedge? And so Mrs. Job lost her desire for daybreak. And then she shows up in the living room where her husband is lamenting his pain. And she said, man, just cast God and die. And I tell you, Job was a good man. You know, he didn't turn around and say, man, girl, you're tripping. He didn't do that. He was more sophisticated than I am. Job 
said, you, you know, he was so, he was so smooth, you know. He said, you speak like, he said, like a foolish woman. He didn't even say you were foolish, you know. He said, you speak like a foolish woman. Because he knew what kind of wife he had in the first place. You know, he knew well, you were better than this. In other words, you know better than that. But you see, the devil was using her to accomplish what he wanted to do in the first yes. place. Be careful! Yes. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Yes. Can I say that again? Yes. Be careful! I'm, I'm, I'm serious as stage four cancer. Be careful who you surround yourself with, especially when you're going through trials and tribulations. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Because here she was, discouraging her husband. Mm. Not even knowing that she was the vehicle that the enemy was using her. Mm. I don't think she knew it. Because she was a God-fearing woman. You know, Job being a God-fearing man, I'm sure he asked God for a wife. And God must have given him a God-fearing woman. But you see, at, this, at the weakest moment of her life, mm -hmm. and that's when the enemy always comes to us. Yeah. Before daybreak. At the weakest moments of our life, that's when he comes. And so he came to her and she said, Cast God and die. Mm. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Amen. Amen. Amen? Be careful who is coming your way when they're playing here comes the bride. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who are you walking towards when they're playing, here comes the bride? Because some of the problems that you may have right now, some of the problems that you may have maybe as a, a result of you hooking up with a daybreak killer. That's what I call them. Those daybreak killers. And Mrs. Joe, I see Brother Dwayne here. Mrs. Joe, Mrs. Joe. Get, get your mind back to church. Get your mind back to church. <laughs> Mrs. Job was a daybreak killer. Yes, she was. She was ready to disguise her husband, right? And she said, curse God and die. I know she might have been 36, 24, 38. A brick house. That brick house may get you into the outer house. You know, he may be like the Chippendale, you know? He may be chiseled like a, the Chippendale. But if you're not careful, he may chisel your hopes, your dreams, your desires, even your destiny from your life. Be careful who you hook yourself and who you surround yourself with. Especially in the time of trials and tribulations. Amen? Amen. So, if you don't allow, you, if you don't mind, this is this is my wife walking in here. I, I just had to say that. <laughs> this is the second time this sermon is on pause. <laughs> you know, in the White House, they call the, the the wife of the president the first lady, right? In the light of all that's been happening, she's not the first lady. She's the only lady. Right, come on, guys. Yes, so we you, you see that point right mrs job comes i feel my help coming now you, 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 you see mrs job moves and tells her husband why don't you just cast god and die and that's my young people my young people and all the ones are like be careful who you surround yourself with be careful who's walking down the aisle when they're playing. Yeah. Here comes the bride. Amen. Because you can be hooked with a daybreak killer. Right. Yes, you can. And so, as you see here, Mr. Job tells his wife, hey, you speak like a foolish woman. Should we just receive good things from God? 
not evil. Now remember that. Remember he had no idea what happened behind the scene. Now you and I can easily say, you know, the Lord, the Lord gives away, the Lord takes it. That's easy to say because we have hindsight. And hindsight is always 2020, right? He, had not, he didn't have that benefit. He was dealing with things in real time. And so he said, but this is what Job did. And this is my recommendation to everyone here at Lighthouse. When troubles come, do what Job did. Wash. That's it. There you go, sister. That's all you got to do. When trouble comes, when tribulation comes, just wash it. Because that's exactly what Job did. He fell down on his face and praised God. You know what you do when you do that? You know what you do when you do that? You confuse the devil. Yeah. Because you are not having the reflex reaction to your tribulation. Can I say that one more time? You don't have the reflex reaction to your trials and tribulation. So when the devil comes to you this way and expect a particular reaction, you don't have that. He expects you to flip and cuss. You bless and pray. You don't know what to do with it. You are driving to work and every light is red. Instead of cussing and all of that, you 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 got CC wine and BB wine and stuff. praying in there, talking about love in strange places. You praise God, you confuse the devil. You know, your wife comes home and she is tripping. I mean, your husband comes home. And he is likewise driven. You just put your arms around her. And you, you tell how much you love her. Alright? And the enemy, he's just, he's confused. What should I do with this brother? What can I do to this sister? You know, he has everything set up for you. But you don't have that reaction that he's expecting. What you do is you worship God. You praise God. And you glorify God. Because again, He is worthy of our praise. Now you remember, you remember we already, we, we already learned that God put a hedge around all of us, right? That's number one, right? He put a hedge around us. And then if the hedge is removed and anything gets to us, it has to be permitted by Him. He has to put it in the balance. And he has to give the devil permission uh -huh. to get to us. Yeah. So when something happens in our lives, mm -hmm. and that is not of our own doing, mm -hmm. just praise God. Yeah. Just magnify him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Another thing that I want to, 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 to uh, suggest to us is pray for the provision of patience. Pray for the provision of patience. Mm -hmm. As you go through, as you're looking for daybreak, Amen. not only should you never lose your desire for daybreak, but pray for the provision of patience. Because patience is not microwavable. It doesn't happen overnight. And be careful what you pray for. This is not just a cliche. Be careful what you pray for, because when you pray for patience, God will have to take you through some stuff to develop your patience. Amen? Amen. Can I give you some Bible? Yeah. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. The Bible says, tribulation brings about patience. So when you pray for patience, in other words, you're asking for tribulation. But remember again, that no matter what you go through, God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when I allow something to happen in your life, it's because I've already put it in the balance. And I believe Sister Tina can handle that. I believe my brother Nas can handle that. So he said, before I allow it to happen, I'm going to put it in the balance and then I'm going to let it be. So as you pray for patience, allow God to develop that, to develop your patience. And that's how you get that grand testimony. Everybody wants a testimony, you know. But they don't want to go through something. You've got to go through something to be able to testify about something, right? They say a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. 
Amen. 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 That you have to allow your faith to be tested. Yes. And then you can be trusted. So in this case, we see that Job went through all this, but he had to go through this with patience. Yes. And he kept on praising God. He kept on glorifying God. The Bible says, in all this, he never sinned against God. Amen. I mentioned that his suffering could have been shortened. It was extended because he tried to justify himself before God. But he did not sin against God. So develop patience. Amen? Amen. And then one final point. Remember that the future is always bright. Because the God that we serve is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. Amen? Amen. In Joshua chapter 1, I was showing this with Elder Barnes earlier. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 5, God is talking to Joshua. And he says, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And nobody in all the days of your life, in all the days of your life. You know, sometimes we read the Bible so fast. But right there, God says, in all the days of your life. And because I knew I'm going to come before this intelligence audience, right? So I had to do my homework a little bit. So I did a research on the word all. That's A-L-L. -L. I looked it up in Swahili. And I found out that all means all. And I went on and looked it up in Spanish. And I found out the word all meant all. I said, I'm going to look it up in Portuguese. And I found that the word all meant all. So I went back to, as Donald Trump would say, America. That's English. So I came back to English. And the word all means all. So when God says, in all the days of your life, that's exactly what he means. All the days of your life. Today is April 7th. He's with you. Tomorrow, April 8th, he's going to be with you. Come June 1st, 2018, he's going to be with you. Come July 4th, 2018, he's going to be with you. Why? Because he's the God who cannot lie. Amen? Amen. And he said, all the days of your life, I will be with you. So the future, the morning is bright. Daybreak is coming. I know daybreak is coming because God is faithful. He is faithful. Psalm 30, he said, weeping may endure for the night, right? But joy comes in the morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. James, James said, count it all joy. Count it all joy. When was the last time that you were going through trials and you counted it joy? If you haven't done it before, that's all right. Study today, you can do it. Amen? That's growing in grace. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that it's just going to be there to strengthen you. Amen? Amen? David said in Psalm chapter 4, he said, Wait upon the Lord and be of good courage. And he shall do what? He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. And you know what Isaiah said, right? It's one of my favorite Bible scriptures. He said, They that wait upon the Lord, right? Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, right? They shall walk and they shall run and not get and they shall walk and not faint, right? But what do they do? What they're doing that? They are waiting on the Lord, right? Yes. So wait on the Lord. Okay. You're looking for daybreak, just like Job did. He said, I'm tossing and I'm turning. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting. I'm having nightmare. I find myself in a nightmare situation. 7,000 sheep lost, right? 3,000 camels gone. 500 yoke of oxen gone. 500 female donkeys, gone. 10 children, dead and gone. Lost my friend, or so-called friends, right? My wife's affinity and affection, gone. And here's the final thing, Lighthouse. 
His relationship with God was on shaky ground, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. He almost lost that. Mm -hmm. Because he started questioning God, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And that, out of everything that Job could have lost, that's the one thing that would have been the most dangerous had he lost. Yeah. Because as you see at the end of his life, yeah. that's right, at the end of, the, of his life, he was able to get all the sheep. Yeah. And he was able to get more of the camels. He was able to get more of the donkeys, right? And he was able to get more of the sons and more of the daughters. As a matter of fact, the Bible, the Holy Ghost, you know, the Holy Spirit is something else. The Holy Spirit said not only did Job have daughters, he, the Bible said he had the most beautiful daughters on the planet. Come on now. That's, that, you know, when God hooks you up, he hooks you up. I love me some Jesus, man. I mean, that's deep, isn't it? Yeah, that's why that, look, I don't want, I don't care about empire and all this stuff on the TV. I just get in the Word. I get excited when I read the Word. I say, what? This brother had daughters, and the Bible says they were so bad. <laughs> you gotta be bilingual, you know, that's what they say in the Greek, you know, they were bad. But they were the most beautiful daughters on the planet. You know, just like when, when, when the Bible is talking about Joseph, you know, the brother had the Holy Spirit in him, right? We know that because the Bible said that. Everywhere he went, the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. When the brother threw him in the pit, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. When they took him up and sold him into slavery, to part of his house, what did the Bible say? And the, and the Lord was with Joseph. When he was thrown in prison, accused of false charges of rape, talking about sexual misconduct, that was the first case of sexual harassment, false one. And the Bible said the Lord was with Joseph. But not only that, that part, the Bible says the brother was good looking. And when you talk about Saul, the first king of Israel, he said from the crown of his head, <laughs> at the bottom of his feet. He was good looking. So the Bible talk about Job at the end that not only did he was he able to regain, you know, God is restores, right? Yes. God restores. Can I say that again? Yes. I don't care what you have lost or what you're losing right now. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. You might have been in a relationship that had taken so much out of you. <laughs> Marriage that took so much out of you and you felt like you had lost something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something I know. That God restores. God restores. He will restore your joy. He will restore your happiness. He will restore your peace of mind. He will restore a relationship. Even if you're in a relationship right now that's not just right, trust in Him. Give it back to him. Yeah. He will fix it. Yeah. Yes, he will. There's nothing that he cannot fix. Right. So at the end of Job's life, not only was he able to regain all of this, but he regained his wife's affection, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Come on, he regained his wife's affection, right? right. Yeah. yeah, that's how he had the kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He didn't go and marry some other person. The same wife that was talking noise. <laughs> After he, you know, I told you what to do, right? He said, put your arm around her, right? That's the way you deal with it, right? Put your arm around it. Even if you feel like my, 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 one of my greatest philosophers, I took philosophy, one of my greatest philosophers, Marvin Gaye. You, you'll get it on your way home. <laughs> Because there are times when you, you feel like throwing your hands up and holler, right? Even when you want to feel like that. Say, just put your arm around me. And so that's what Job did in the end. He put his, hand, his arm around his sister. And they had some children. And the Bible says, they were beautiful. I'm, I'm hanging on in this neighborhood because I want to tell you this. No matter what the enemy may try to steal out of our lives, as long as we stay faithful to God, God will restore 
what the locust and the conquer worm has stolen. Except when he restores, he does it even better. He put a little icing on the top. They were beautiful, then they say that. He put a little cherry on top. Because that's what he does. Amen? That's the God we serve. You're looking for a daybreak, never lose your desire for daybreak. You may be tossing and turning. You may be crying. Never lose your desire for daybreak. Amen? Amen. And then keep on praying for the provision of patience. Ask God to strengthen you. Ask God to fortify you. And even if you stumble and fall, let me give you some breaking news. You are going to stumble and fall. Yeah, you all should be nodding your heads on that one. You are going to sin. I'm not giving license to sin. I'm not doing that. But I'm telling you, as long as you are alive, you are going to come short. But know this, the Bible says, the righteous person falls down seven times. But my God, he will lift you up. Amen. Amen. One final word. One final story and then I'm out of here. There's a high school in South Carolina. And every year, they used to have an annual singing contest. They used to have an annual singing contest. And year after year, this young lady used to sing her heart out. And when the first year they had the contest, she won it hands down. The second year they had the same contest. And everybody practiced, had some new music lessons and voice lessons and all of that. And she showed up, man, did the same thing, wiped the slate clean. She won. The third year, you know, the other people came second and third and fourth. They prepared as much as they could. And they said, this is it. This is our year right here. And they went on and tried. They competed. And she won for three years in a row. So there was a lot of frustrations among the competitors, right? And they said, you know, we can't let her win. You know how it is. You know, there's a word my wife and I use at home. It's called hateration. You won't find it in Webster Dictionary, but that's what we made. It's called hateration. You know, you be, God has given an anointing in your life, or God is making you prosper in some areas. You always find somebody who doesn't like what's going in your life. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't mean to say this, but the Holy, the Holy Spirit just tweeted this to me right now. Sister Barnes. I love Sister Barnes. My wife and I are crazy about Sister Barnes. She has the gift. She's one of the most organized individual you can meet. She just is. And she can organize, she can do stuff in a way that's just mind boggling. So you can have a gift like that, but not everybody can celebrate you. That's sad, isn't it? We don't do that at Lighthouse, you know? Like we don't do that here. So they were hating on the young lady because she had the talent. And she was winning, and winning, and winning. So on the fourth year, they said, you know what? We're going to bring the best of the best. So the first person went up there and, and they played the music. Oh, before they even played the music, Sister Cabrina, they said, this is what I want all of you to sing. I want all of you to sing the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, the Lord's Prayer. Because they didn't know which song they are going to sing. That's the, that's the surprise. Every year they will tell them the songs. So they thought that she had enough time to prepare, right? So they say, we just want you to sing the Lord's Prayer. And so the first competitor came up there on stage and gave all that they had. And they got the clapping and which they finished. When he finished, he got the, you know, they clapped for him and gave him a standing ovation. A little standing ovation and then sit down. A young lady came up and he, she sang her heart out. And they were moved. Even the judges were clapping. And then the young lady, you know, the defending champion, <laughs> she got up on stage and she took the mic and she bowed down and she prayed and she sang and she sang and she sang and she sang and when she finished 
you know, she dropped the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to connect, Sister Cabrina. She dropped the mic. And in the language of young people, she dropped the mic. And I'm telling you, everybody got up. And they gave her the standing ovation. And they clapped for her. But they were frustrated. Because they say now she's won, she's winning. This is the fourth time she's winning. You know? And as if, as a matter of formality, I guess, the judge say, you know, well, let's, let's do something. We're going to open it up to the community. Now, that, that now, come on now. These were high school kids competing among themselves, right? So now the judges try to sabotage the young lady. They say, we're going to open it up to the community. That's fine. They say, is there anyone in the audience who want to sing? And there was a little old lady in the back of the audience. She raised her hand. She said, you know, can I sing? And they said, sure, come in. And everybody turned to look, and they were surprised. They were surprised because she was the young lady's music teacher. Yeah. So you know she's already, she has she, what we call in basketball, she has a home court, she has a home court, home court advantage, right? So now she comes to sing the Lord's Prayer that she has taught the young lady to sing. She get the mic, she square her shoulders, tip her head to the right, and she starts singing the Lord's Prayer. And she sang, and she sang, and she sang, and she sang it. Remember, she's the teacher, right? And she sang it, when she finished, she dropped the mic. <laughs> And she got even the strongest ovation and the clapping. And so at the end, the judges say, is there anyone else? Because they knew she got the trophy now, you know? <laughs> is there anyone else? And there they were, Brother Dan Scott. There he was. There was a brother way back in some dirty overalls. And all he had was a mop in his hand. A mop in his hand and a bucket. And he put the bucket down. And he put the mop on the side. And with slow steps, he pulled up to the stage. And he took the microphone. Bowed his head. He never had any music lessons or anything like that. And he took the microphone and he started singing the Lord's Prayer. And he sang. And he sang. And he sang. He didn't drop the mic. He put the mic down. You could hear a pin drop. Nobody clapped. Nobody got up to give him a standing ovation. But when they looked around, there were tears on everybody's face. Everybody was crying. And then finally, when they got together, they got up and they clapped for him. And they gave him the standing ovation. And they called him by name. And they gave him the trophy. And when he was getting off the stage, a young man ran to him and he said, Mr. Janitor, Mr. Janitor, can I, I'm from the student newspaper. Can I interview you for a second? He said, sure. And he said, you are just a janitor. They have been trained. There's a music student over here. And she's a music teacher. How do you know? How did you know to sing like that? How were you able to sing the Lord's Prayer like that? He smiled and he looked at her. He looked at him and his son. It's just as simple as this. They were singing the Lord's Prayer. They knew the words of the Lord's Prayer. But I knew the Lord they were singing about. I knew the Lord they were singing about. As you go today, remember, daybreak is coming. And daybreak is coming simply because Lord, that's going to bring about daybreak. Amen? Just so not enough to know 
the Lord's Prayer. Right. It's not enough to know about this Lord, but you got to have the personal relationship. Yeah. you got to know Jesus for yourself. Amen? Yeah. Does anyone know who Jesus is? Yeah. Does anyone know the Jesus that I'm talking about? Yeah. I know him because he walks with me yeah. and he oh. talks and he tells me that I am his own and the joy I'm talking about the joy that we share as we tarry there none other has ever known that's the joy that's the kind of joy David was talking about this in Psalm 51 after he sinned against God and, and, and Pastor Nathan showed up and he said you are the man and Pastor Nathan said David can I pray with you and David said, Pastor, can I pray for myself? He said, yes. He said, and that's where you get in Psalm 51. David said, have mercy upon me, O Lord. According to the multitude of thy tenderness, blot out my transgression, right? And then he goes on to say, restore the joy of your salvation. Restore the joy of your salvation. Because David knew the Lord of his life. You gotta know the Lord of your life. You gotta know Jesus for yourself. The old folk used to say, when you're talking about Jesus, he's a friend of mine. That's Jesus. And you know who he is, right? That's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's act. He's Moses bush on fire. That's Jesus. He's Joshua's battle axe. That's Jesus. He's Gideon's fleece. That's Jesus. He's Samson's power. That's Jesus. He's David's music. That's Jesus. He's Solomon's wisdom. That's Jesus. He's Jeremiah's bomb in Gilead. That's Jesus. Ezekiel's wheel in the middle of the wheel. That's Jesus. God's only son. That's Jesus. Amen. Mary's baby boy. James and Jude's older brother. Matthew's king. Luke's great physician. John's word made flesh, right? Acts the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus. The rock in the weary land. The shelter in the time of storm. Bread when you're hungry. Friend when you're friendless. I'm talking about Jesus. So when you're looking for day bread, just look for Jesus. Because he is the I am that I am. His first name is the same as his last name. When Moses said, who should I say sent me? God said, tell them. That I am, that I am, sent you. Amen. 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 Give him praise. Amen. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. The song says, say, I have had many tears and sorrows. Eh? I had doubts even for tomorrow. I didn't even know right from wrong. But through all this tribulation, God gave me blessed consolation to know that my trials only came to make me strong. Amen? Amen. Through it all, through it all, I have learned to trust in Jesus. I have learned to trust in God. If you know that, if you have learned to do that, give me praise. I have learned to depend upon His Word. Through it all, through it all, I have learned to depend upon His Word. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. Can we give us to God be the glory, sister? Amen? To God be the glory.
team here from Sister Adrian. Please welcome her with a big hand. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. He touched me. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's pray and talk to our Father. He touched me. He touched me. Oh Lord, we are coming to you this afternoon. We want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for touching us today. Through music, through the spoken word, through prayer. Thank you, God, for touching us. And Lord, under the sound of my voice, I pray if there's anyone who has been touched. And Lord, they say, Lord, take me just as I am. Without one plea. But that the blood was shed for me. Oh Lord, unto me, I come just as I am. I'm coming to you. Lord, I pray, if anyone under the sound of my voice want to surrender their lives to you, Lord, I pray, God, that they make that commitment to walk with you for the rest of their lives. I pray, God, if anyone has reached that commitment. They say, Lord, I want to surrender today. I want to join the band of believers. I want to be numbered among those who shall spend eternity with God. You can just raise your hand and say, I surrender my life today. I surrender my life today. Praise God. Lord, take me just as I am and I want to walk with you. I want to make a commitment once again to say, Lord, walk with me. I want to leave this Sabbath service today a new person because you touched me. And because I know that there will be daybreak. No matter what I'm going through right now, yet you give me a word today that there will be daybreak, that you will restore. In that only you, God, only you are worthy of our praise. So, Lord, you have seen the heart, you have seen the hand, and I pray that you see the commitment. I pray that your Holy Spirit will dwell with your children from this day forward until we see each other again when you permit us to. We thank you. We praise you. I pray right now, Lord, for the guests. Sister Adrian and Brother Dwayne, Brother Keith, and Sister Dolores who came and brought a spirit of worship at Lighthouse today. We thank you for them, God. And we pray that they will feel welcome and loved and feel come back again, Lord. We may be few in number here today, but we know that you don't count the numbers, but you make the numbers count. And that they will come back and this place will be even full. And they will have another fellowship with their brothers and sisters in the kingdom. We thank you, God. We thank you for these young people that came here today during intercessory prayer and committed themselves to you. We thank you for Sister Kowalski and leading them into prayer. We need to exercise that weapon of prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you for this service. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, amen.